And I want to introduce Becky Alp. Uh, she's here from NUFS and she's going to talk about um, her research. So I'll turn it over to you, Becky. Thank you. Thanks, Cam. Great host. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Becky. And um, well, thank you so much for sticking around. Um, I've, um, I'm overwhelmed by um, all this like amazing, really interesting and thought provoking presentations all day. So I really do hope that you find my presentation um, interesting and thought provoking. <laughs> um, so today I wanna to talk about something that I'm very passionate about, um, linguistic relativity um, hypotheses or, or Sapir-Whorf or Whorfian um, hypotheses. And, um, um, and implications for second language acquisition. So um, being a polyglot and, and a language learner pretty much my whole life, I've, um, I kind of had this kind of like personal experience. And um, the more I kind of start to get fluent in um, a new language, uh, the more I realize like certain changes in myself. And I start to kind of like change the way um, I behave or act or um, even like perceive like certain things. And then I, it just got me like thinking about um, kind of like these cognitive changes in myself. So that was my personal experience. And then I kind of um, stumbled upon linguistic relativity theory. And, and I've been reading about it since then. And I, I find it quite fascinating. And I really do hope that you um, find it useful or interesting as well. So um, we, okay, moving on. I um, first want to talk about uh, my plan for the presentation today. So pretty much, um, uh, I think it's very straightforward. So first I want to talk about what is linguistic relativity very briefly, and then linguistic relativity and second language acquisition. And I want to talk about two very important concepts um, that are related to my research as well. Um, verbal and nonverbal behavior and concept agency. And then I move on to my um, research methodology and then discussion and finally conclusion. So um, what is linguistic creativity hypothesis? Very simply, um, it's just the language we speak shape the way we think, right? And um, I don't know if you've um, seen the movie Arrival. Um, it was mentioned in the movie and um, and I think since then, like, um, it kind of um, became a little bit more popular and people are starting to kind of get more interested in it. But this is like a very simple definition of it. And if we want to kind of um, understand like more and find a detailed definition, um, uh, Gettner and Golden Meadow defined it, described it like this. Um, languages vary in their semantic partitioning of the world. The structure of one's language influences how one perceives the world. Therefore, speakers of different languages will perceive the world differently. So um, pretty much the structure of the language, but um, with um, kind of recent kind of research, we've kind of realized like there are different factors um, kind of um, play a role in, in kind of describe how changing the, the language um, perception. Um, while this linguistic relativity idea uh, fascinated researchers in several research disciplines, from linguists to cognitive scientists and anthropologists, the actual empirical research into the field was only done after the 1990s. Um, Edward Sapir was the um, was the one who came with this, who came up with this concept uh, for the first time in 1929, and then um, Benjamin Lee Whorf, and that's why it's um, known as Sapir Whorf. Um, theory and um, but until the 1990s there weren't like a lot of empirical research and um, and recently um, most of the research um, done into uh, linguistic relativity focuses on monolingual speakers with um, cross-linguistic research and um, so, um, but recently, I guess, um, studies have been done on speakers of more than one language, and I've been reading a lot about that. And um, there have been studies done by linguists into the cognitive and linguistic blueprint of L2 speakers' mind. So why is this important? Why are we kind of uh, start to get interested in um, kind of 
um, investigating linguistic relativity and second language um, acquisition? Well, there are several reasons. Um, learning a new language play a huge role in changing the cognitive state of the L2 speaker. And in order to understand these cognitive changes, um, we, focus, we need to focus on linguistic relativity. And the new linguistic system might affect the way um, the L2 speakers perceive reality in the observed world. And we also aim to kind of um, understand the relationship between um, L2 acquisition and cognition as well. Um, but of course, there's um, a lot of different factors that play a huge um, role into this. And we have to consider all these um, factors like language proficiency of L2 and, and even L1 speaker. Um, so um, what is the, uh, the general proficiency for, of the speaker of L2 and, and even with their L1? And the language contact, uh, the amount of contact that a bilingual has with their language, um, la bilingual language mode, which is the degree of activation, how active do they use L2? Um, and the age of L2 acquisition, of course, the age at which um, they start to kind of learn the second language. And then the length of immersion, um, living in a setting where um, L2 is spoken, um, and the context of acquisition, which um, could be described or divided as naturalistic and instructed, naturalistic being um, learning the language in that specific place where the language is spoken or instructed as in the case of um, English education in Japan. So all of the above factors might play a considerable role in the cognitive perceptions of L2 speakers. Um, and so basically we want to know with this um, kind of uh, research into linguistic relativity and second language acquisition, we wanna know what's going on in our brains when learning a new language pretty much. And I think it's quite fascinating. Um, but I want to make a quick um, kind of um, uh, understand, we have to understand um, this these two concepts and we have to kind of, um, understand the difference between these two concepts, linguistic relativity and linguistic diversity. Um, John Lissy said in 1997 that linguistic relativity is not the same as linguistic diversity without the relation to thought more generally beyond that necessary for the act of speaking itself. It's merely linguistic diversity. Um, all languages are different from each other. Right? There's a lot of um, diversity when it comes to languages, and, and this diversity actually involves the act of speaking. So if you want to demonstrate effects of language on something beyond the conscious act of speaking that is on thinking itself, then we need to focus on language rel uh, linguistic relativity instead of linguistic diversity. And in order to do that, um, we need to understand the difference um, between these two uh, concepts in order to kind of do research into linguistic relativity. Um, verbal and nonverbal evidence. So what do I mean by verbal evidence? Um, verbal evidence is behavioral data concerning speech production and comprehension with narrative tasks. So it's everything that is related to the act, the conscious act of speaking itself. Um, it could be uh, film retellings, it could be um, picture descriptions, right? Anything that is uh, related to speech production and comprehension. Whereas nonverbal evidence is behavioral data involving tasks requiring perception, classification, sorting, and matching objects and events. Um, anything that involves kind of um, everything else that is not um, speech production and comprehension. Um, Nonverbal tasks are required to show languages effects on thinking beyond the conscious act of speaking. So this is where we, in order to kind of understand the linguistic relativity, um, we need to kind of focus on nonverbal tasks. If we only focus on verbal tasks, which is the act of speaking, um, we will kind of see the diversity between each language, but then that's not really what we want to do here. Um, the other concept that I wanted to talk about is the concept of agency, which is related to my research. 
Um, the agentivity in linguistics refers to the linguistic marking of the different perspectives in which represented characters are viewed as relating to objects and other characters in the world. There's been uh, multiple studies done on the concept of agency, cross-linguistic um, mostly, but um, um, I want to kind of explain this concept um, with a kind of example. Um, this example actually was, um, um, it's from Falsi and Broditsky's study um, called Constructing Agency. Um, and it was actually done, the research was done um, between Japanese and English speakers. Um, so consider this scenario. Um, a forklift operator is maneuvering his heavy load toward its destination in a crowded warehouse. And as he squeezes around a tight turn, the nearest shelf collapses and millions of dollars worth of fine crystal comes crashing to the floor. Now, was the operator, the tight turn, the rickety shelf, or the fragile crystal the cause? So when we see this um, kind of, you know, incident, and then we try to describe it to someone else, what kind of, how do we describe it? Do we say, oh, look, he, the forklift um, operator, broke the crystals? Or do we, say, do we say, like, oh, the crystal broke? Or do we say, oh, he uh, kind of, you know, made a tight turn? and the crystal uh, broke. So it's very important um, how, what kind of, like how do we kind of describe the situation? Do we use agentive um, kind of sentences or non-agentive um, expressions? Um, so previous work by Falsi and Broditsky has revealed that the causal agent is a context dependent construct with both physical and social context playing important roles. But there are, other several factors um, as well, um, as well as social context, like situation, culture, and differences in language patterns. And although it's hard to pinpoint which factor plays the most significant role in which situation, it's ideal to kind of analyze each element equally. And that's what I'm gonna do now, very briefly. Um, so what do we mean by social context? Um, it's pretty much like, um, different languages and um, describing different kind of social events, right? So if we consider East Asian cultures and Western cultures, they have different perceptions of the self or individual, um, whereas the group, right? And um, so these distinctive societies regard um, self differently and does that kind of social context play a role in uh, the way they kind of describe social events? And then situation, um, so intentional or accidental situations. Again, this is from Broditsky's um, uh, study, like in that forklift operators scenario, um, do we see that um, kind of situation as an intentional? Did he actually um, mean to kind of break that crystal or was it just an accident, right? So this also plays a huge role. And then culture, of course, um, habitual linguistic framing may be a powerful mechanism by which cultural values are propagated. Um, a huge proportion of what we know about the world comes to us through the medium of language and language is a huge part of culture. So we cannot underestimate this factor. And differences in language patterns and structure, um, patterns in everyday descriptions may serve as pervasive and powerful cues to the agency. Um, there was a, um, a study done by um, Nishimitsu and um, in, in 2010, and they kind of like, um, they argued that their um, Japanese and English speakers map form to meaning differently for transitive and intransitive constructions. And they said that um, English speakers tend to use transitives where Japanese speakers kind of prefer intransitives. So um, differences in language patterns and structure definitely play a huge role. Um, so um, after all this, let's um, have a look at my research. And um, so I want to talk about my methodology. And first, I want to start with my research background. So like I mentioned before, it's very important to kind of um, base our research on verbal and nonverbal um, evidence and mostly nonverbal evidence if you want to kind of find um, results in linguistic activity. But I think it's also essential to kind of um, 
involve language in investigating L2 speakers' cognitive changes as well. So I chose to kind of, I've decided to use both verbal and nonverbal evidence. And I decide to use the concept of agency as verbal evidence and perceptive um, visual stimuli as nonverbal evidence. So um, purpose of study, my priority in conducting this research was of course not to find differences between two languages. So it's not really about language, uh, linguistic diversity. Um, this research aims to focus on participants' cognitive perceptions and aims to portray um, the cognitive changes that occur while learning a second language and its effects on L2 speakers' world perception. Um, I try to ask this question, how much do L2 speakers rely on language-specific information and how much do they rely on extra-linguistic details? In this case, um, visual stimuli. Um, so let's talk about my um, research procedure. Um, so participants, 64 university age um, Japanese English speakers um, between the ages of 18 to 21. They all completed the study in class, in my class. Um, participants were selected because they're currently language learners. Um, all participants come from similar language education backgrounds. However, they do not all have the same proficiency in the target language. Uh, for materials, um, participants were given three drawings out of five of a boy, sketches done by my colleague, marked as boy A, B, C, D, and E. Um, the pictures portray a boy beside a table and a broken vase on the floor in seemingly identical ways. And the only difference between each picture is the boy's facial expression, indicating a possible change in each situation. So here are the pictures. I know that it's they're a little bit small and you can't really see um, boy's face. Well, um, yeah, there are faces that much, but um, we're gonna look at the we're gonna look at each picture separately um, in a minute. But um, overall, um, Participants saw these pictures and without the captions, but um, I wrote these captions for, for, for this presentation. So boy A um, has a more of a stern expression. Also, he seems a bit worried, uh, could be an indicative of a stressful situation. Uh, boy B has a more expressive face, um, about to burst into he, but he's about to burst into tears, indicating a possible guilt. Um, boy C, um, is um, his facial expression shows feelings of shock and regret, indicating a possible accident. Um, boy D has a more expressionless face, indicating surprise without a hint of guilt. And for boy E, the most expressionless face, indicating nothing about the situation. And also participants saw um, these five sentences in English version and Japanese version, um, identical. Um, the vase broke, he broke the vase, he made the vase break, he knocked the table and the vase broke and his vase is broken. Um, so the first and the last sentences are non-agentive sentences, non-agentive expressions, and the, um, the three in between are agentive expressions, but they have different degrees of directness. Um, if we just use he broke the vase, then it would be more of a, a, a simple transitive causative direct kind of um, causative. Um, he made a vase break is a little bit more indirect way of saying it. And again, he knocked the table and the vase broke is again a more um, indirect way. So um, let's move on to research procedure. Um, so how did I conduct this study? Participants were put into two categories randomly and asked to match three random pictures with the English and Japanese sentences given to them in separate groups. And they're asked to find a sentence that describes the situation the best. Um, they matched the sentences with the pictures at their own pace and received no instructions or feedback. And pictures were put in random groups and mixed multiple times. Um, initial results, I was very surprised because each participant spent more time than expected deciding which sentence fit best to which picture. And I think the reason behind this might be narrowed down to two reasons. Um, pictures were seemed very identical at first, 
but then they had to kind of observe it closely to kind of understand uh, differences. And also the sentences, again, uh, they seemed very identical in meaning. So um, I think they just kind of um, had to decide like how to describe the situation. And some participants even said it's hard while trying to do the task. Um, here's the overall results. Um, we're going to go through each picture and we're going to kind of analyze each picture now. But as you can see, there's like a huge difference between Japanese and English versions. So for boy A, this is the picture of boy A. And like I said, um, this one has a very kind of, um, um, kind of stern expression. He's, he might've seemed a bit worried, maybe a little bit stressful situation. So for this picture, 11 out of 16 chose he broke the vase as the best answer for um, the English version. But for Japanese version, they chose a, a non-agentive expression. The vase is broken, which is really surprising. Um, this is boy B. I'm a little bit rushing through it. Hopefully I have enough time. Um, for boy B, um, he has a more expressive face um, he looks a little bit guilty. So for this picture, um, five out of 16 chose um, he made the vase uh, break. Um, and and um, yeah, and and four out of 16 equally went with he knocked the table and the vase broke and the vase is broken. So for for English version, it was again um, agentive. And for Japanese version, um, they chose, uh, he broke the vase, again, an agentive answer. Um, this is boy C, he is the, he, this is the picture that shows more of an expressive face with, um, could be an accidental event because he, he looks a bit shocked and surprised. For this answer, um, eight um, participants chose, he broke the vase in uh, English version. And seven um, chose he made the vase break in Japanese um, version. Um, for boy D, um, he kind of looks a bit confused, um, a little bit expressionless, but also um, also looks surprised, but not um, indicating any type of guilt. Um, for this one. Uh, participants went with he knocked the table and the vase break and he broke the vase for English versions and eight out of 16 chose the vase is broken a non-agentive um, expression for the Japanese version and for the last one which has absolutely showing no expression um, is um, went with for the Jap uh, for the English version they went with the vase is broken and again Japanese version they went with same answer okay I'm checking this five minutes left okay thank you that was before right, I'm gonna rush through um the discussion then and well technically um what happened is um they answered uh, pretty much the same. They chose agentive expressions for English, except for the last one, which was this picture. And for Japanese versions, they preferred non-agentive expression. And um, in conclusion, I think this research shows um, differences between the cognitive perceptions of bilinguals with their usage of L1 and L2, and these differences in the same visual stimuli and language specific information might be based on a myriad of factors um, that is indeed kind of hard to analyze, but very vital if you want to kind of understand more about the human mind. Um, how much did they rely on language specific information and how much extra linguistic evidence is yet to be discovered, but I'm determined to, to do a, a further um, kind of research on uh, linguistic relativity and second language acquisition. Um, and I want to finish with um, a quote from George Orwell, 1984, um, as an ironic. <laughs> But um, here's my references. Special thanks to Je Jessica for uh, the illustrations and Masako for the Japanese translations. I'm sorry, I think I went over time. My apologies, but thank you very much for listening. 
Great. Thank you, Becky. That was uh, very informative and I really enjoyed that. Um, so I'm going to stop recording now. Mm -hmm.